Um, yes, so today my talk is about uh, hacking ethics in education. And um, I sort of on purpose made the, the uh, title a, bit, a little bit um, uh, have different meanings. So I'll be talking about hacking in education first. So um, a little bit of background why we do hacking um, and what kind of hacking we do. Um, then I'll be talking about hacking ethics in education, how the um, people feel about the, the hacking um, and how they work on hacking. And then I'm talking about hacking ethics into education. Um, and I'll be talking about the, the different viewpoints. So I'll be talking about the viewpoints from the students, uh, the teachers, and uh, most importantly, the administration of the university. Um, the um, hacking in education, we have a uh, system and network engineering master, as uh, uh, where I'm a teacher. Um, uh, this started at the University of Amsterdam in 2003. So we have been doing this for 11 years. Um, there are, so this deals with various subjects uh, of uh, system and network engineering. Um, we have networking experts, but we also t um, uh, educate uh, forensics experts. Um, so we have various security related uh, courses throughout, uh, uh, throughout the year. Um, and there are many different research projects, which are very intensive research projects where the students work on a, a single topic for one month. Um, and they really delve deep into, uh, uh, into a uh, particular subject. And uh, some examples of what they do uh, within a month or six weeks, if it's, this is during the course. Um, one of the first hacks of the, the OV chip card, the, the uh, Dutch public transport uh, chip card, that would, uh, that's um, happened by students by our education. Um, we um, did some hack on uh, Tinder, which um, I may talk about if I have some time. Uh, we have found vulnerabilities in mobile banking apps um, that students worked on, and uh, also the, the Dutch passport chip um, was cloned by a student of ours. Um, now, if we talk about hacking ethics in education, um, what students think they do when they're, when they're hacking, um, they feel they're very powerful and they can hack anything. Um, they want to break stuff and they think um, they have the knowledge and they um, are really into hacking and uh, they want to um, scrutinize the security of products and they want to, they, their first aim is to break stuff. They don't want to see if something is secure or not, they want to break stuff. Then if you look at what the teachers think they do, <laughs> is they're shooting peas. Um, most of them are not very convinced yet, and most of these uh, things are reasonably secure and it's well thought out. Um, it's interesting that the students learn about uh, um, looking at the security of different products, um, and it's good that they start shooting at it and, and see how that um, uh, feels like. Um, but most of the things aren't uh, really effective. That doesn't mean, so the security, of, uh, the hacking itself may not be effective, but the uh, experience for the students is very effective. Um, uh, what the administration thinks that they do is, is different. They're very scared. Um, they think that these students are all very lead hackers and uh, are breaking stuff and uh, doing this in very nasty ways that uh, the teachers don't see. Now, the problem with this is um, even if you're shooting peas, sometimes you shoot at the right spot and you break stuff. Um, this is what happened with the, the mobile banking security. We thought, well, we can let the students look at mobile banking security and they probably have their, have their um, act together. Um, and uh, it, it was even audited. Um, the mobile uh, uh, banking app was audited uh, by a very professional company, but um, the students looked at this for a day or two and they, they, it was completely broken. Um, <laughs> Um, they could, uh, yeah. They scared the, the banking official by showing him his his um, pin number when they did the demonstration. <laughs> um, um, but even even if you're not breaking stuff, if you're shooting peas at somebody, uh, they can get very annoyed. Um, uh, even if you're not br really breaking stuff. Um, and then if they get annoyed, and then 
um, very often the old boys network kicks in um, and the staff, the upper staff of the, the company contacts the upper staff of the administration and they panic and freak out. <laughs> and, um, and that's when um, we started doing the, the hacking ethics in education because what, so the um, hacking ethics in education, um, because we wanted to see that the, the uh, we wanted to show the administration that they, they, they really are ethical hackers, that they're thinking about what they're doing. So um, the administration, they freaked out um, and they did what they always do when, the, when university administration freaks out, they formed a committee. <laughs> um, they formed an ethical committee uh, for the computer science faculty. Um, and this was for the whole faculty. Um, uh, and it included all non-standard research. So the, the standard research that the, the, each of the, the research groups do that doesn't have to go through the, the whole ethical uh, um, evaluation procedure. Um, but if you do anything out of the ordinary, then you have to, uh, um, or you should be uh, doing something with the ethical committee. Um, the problem a little bit with this ethical committee was that it's formed by eight uh, group leaders of the, the computer science faculty. Um, and the problem with group leaders is that they have a very busy agenda. So the, the uh, um, uh, ethical committee doesn't meet very often. And they don't have a lot of time to review projects. And um, like I mentioned earlier in my talk, we have a one-year program, and it's a very intensive program, uh, and we don't have a lot of time if students are doing projects to review those projects, especially not if we're um, uh, talking about the, um, the, the review time in the, in the matter of months. That doesn't work with our education. Um, and finally, there was also a lawyer on the ethical committee, um, but there, in this ethical committee, there is no ethical um, there's no ethicist, um, which is a bit strange, I think, because um, uh, I wonder how this makes it an ethical committee, but they think that this is an ethical committee. Um, um, we, so we found we had to deal with this because this was the ethical committee for our computer science faculty, uh, and they were imposing us that uh, all of our projects had to go through them. And then we said, well, um, maybe we can hack the process um, uh, and we form a committee ourselves. Um, so we formed an ethical committee for the master education um, and uh, we wrote a procedure how to um, make the students think about the, the ethical aspects of their security research. Um, when they do a, a research project or a security project, the first thing they have to do is they write a proposal of what they're planning to do. Um, this is so that we know uh, and we have some idea that they uh, know what they're doing, um, that uh, we think that this is a valuable project, um, that, they, that this is interesting enough for the course that they can uh, get a passing grade at the end of the course. Um, but we changed this so that they also now have to write an ethical paragraph into that project plan. So um, at the end of the project plan, they have to say, what are the, the ethical impacts um, of this project, what is the uh, who is going to get harmed if you if you actually break stuff? Um, uh, are you impacting on the privacy of user data? Are you getting access to user data? Um, and these kinds of things uh, they have to write down and they have to um, uh, defend this uh, to the the teacher. Then the teacher of the course uh, with the ethical committee of the the master education. It's a very small, very small uh, ethical committee, um, and they meet uh, and they evaluate all of the projects that the students do, uh, uh, handed in, and we uh, first of all we check whether the uh, the ethical paragraph that they handed in is actually complete, that they identified all the major issues, that they identified um, uh, um, all of the things that could go wrong, all the actors that may get involved. And then, um, uh, and then we um, give this a traffic light status. We go from green to uh, red. Green means that there's basically no ethical considerations uh, uh, involved. This is a, 
uh, evaluation of a security tool or an offline analysis of something um, where they don't get into contact with any user data, that it doesn't have an impact on, uh, on user privacy, uh, etc. Um, yellow is if they may get into contact with, uh, um, uh, with personal data, uh, but in a very confined way, or um, we don't think that they will break stuff, um, and if they do, it will not have a very high impact on society. Um, orange is where things get uh, a little bit serious, where they have access to a lot of, they possibly have access to a lot of user data, uh, privacy impacting uh, data, uh, or if they actually manage to break things, then um, this is going to have a very high security impact. Um, and red is something that we, um, is a status that we use for projects that, that actually cross the line, but may uh, be important to do anyway. Um, <laughs> or not. Uh, I mean, sometimes you have projects and, and um, you're going to cross an ethical line, uh, but it may be that the, the problem is so important or so politically relevant um, that you think that uh, this is a project that has to be done anyway. Uh, but then we agreed with the ethical committee for the faculty that any project that is going to be read, uh, we're going to report to them before we start doing the project and we get uh, permission to do this. Um, uh, and this has worked very well uh, over the last year. Um, from the students' standpoint, we've looked, we've now uh, forced the students to think about ethics when they're doing the research. And this has led to very valuable insights for them and has been a very good experience uh, for them also. And it also means that we force them to, to think about the ethics before they start doing the research. And um, they, ha they um, do an ethics by design in their uh, research plan and how they set up um, experiments. And they think about privacy when they're setting up experiments with user data. Um, and this is something that wasn't... So we had some ethical uh, courses uh, and ethical classes during the year, uh, but then it was mostly abstract and we, st we started the discussions. Um, can you take a computer home with you? If, you, if, if it's an old computer at your uh, company, can you, can you take it? Can you look into users' email boxes? And you do the discussion, but it's still a, a little bit at an abstract level that doesn't really touch the students uh, at that moment. And then it's, it's hard to see if you really made an impression about the ethics of, uh, of, that, um, um, of that issue. But now th this is, uh, by incorporating it in completely into the research, they're forced to think about this and this impacts them in a very uh, uh, profound way because they have to think about their own research that they're doing right now um, and they have to think about this, how do I do this in the, in the right way? And what is the right way? Um, of course, they're still students, so we work with them to uh, help them see these kind of issues. And even, um, like I mentioned, the, the, the traffic light status, um, that also means that the Orange projects get more uh, supervision by the ethics advisor, um, that they get a uh, um, little bit closer interaction, that we monitor what they do and, and um, that we take care that they don't cross the line. Um, finally, at the end of the, uh, of the line, if they do find issues, uh, we do do coordinated disclosure or responsible disclosure as it's also called. Um, and this is done by the <coughs> teachers of the education. Um, this is a conscious choice because um, we find that co coordinated or responsible disclosure is not really accepted uh, that much yet. Uh, it's getting better, but it's not there yet, and it, it usually takes a very long time. Um, we've uh, the, we had some projects before the summer, and it took more than two months to finish all of the uh, coordinated disclosure projects. And this is just time that the students don't have, or if they're doing a project at the end of the of the year they're basically gone. Um, and we have, to, we have to make sure that uh, the procedure is still fi uh, finished. Um, I have some time for the extra slides. 
Um, like I said, uh, Tinder. Um, this was a very interesting research, and we, we uh, showed very much how the, um, the privacy by design and ethics by design worked very well in this research. A um, little bit of uh, background. Um, in July 2013, I mean, everybody knows Tinder, right? Who doesn't know Tinder? Ah, okay. Um, Tinder is a dating app. Um, and it's a very shallow dating app. You, this is the interface. Um, and the way you manage um, the interface is you uh, swipe either left or right, um, saying you like this person or you don't. And if you both like each other, then you get into contact with each other and then you can start chatting and, uh, um, uh, and maybe go on a date or something. Um, the power of Tinder is that it uses GPS to find matches near you. It doesn't really make sense if you get a, a match that's in, uh, in America. Uh, the chance that you actually meet is very slim. Um, so they have to have the GPS coordinates to, of the users in order to uh, find matches near you. Um, the problem was that in July 2013, somebody looked at the traffic that Tinder was sending, uh, and they found that, that Tinder was actually sending the GPS coordinates of other users to your phone uh, in order to measure the distance of, uh, between the two users. Um, this is, of course, a little bit of a privacy uh, problem. <laughs> so um, they fixed this, and then in February, to February 2014, somebody started looking at this again, and they, uh, they fixed this by sending um, the exact distance to the, the person. Um, but the problem with this is that the API that Tinder exposes is actually open. You can just use uh, uh, write the scripts, query the API. Um, so you take th three different points, and then you do trilateration. <laughs> uh, and then you still find the exact location of the user. <laughs> so our, this, is, this was all um, external research. And then in May 2014, our students started looking into this, because the, the, the way that Tinder uh, tried to fix this is because they implemented a, uh, a rounding. So you get, um, if, if, you, if the, the matches are very close to you, they uh, say that this, is, this user is win, within one kilometer. Um, but the API actually exposes uh, a lower boundary uh, that you can set very much lower than one kilometer. And if you do so, um, you get different matches. So they started looking into this, and it turns out that they may say that this is within one kilometer, but because you're using the lower uh, lower bound, it's actually within one uh, 500 meters or within 300 <coughs> within 300 meters or something like that. So you do a little bit more querying, but you still find uh, the user the, the user location. But then. <coughs> How they researched this is they did uh, privacy by design in their research plan. Um, and um, at first they started, <clears throat> I mean, the naive approach is just to match everything, store everything, and then start comparing the results. And we didn't want to do that because we wanted to do preserve <clears throat> the privacy of the users. Um, um, but they used the test user, but they were at the university, and at the university, students are very, um, <coughs> very enthusiastic users of Tinder. So it was very hard to find their own test user. <coughs> there were too many users. So what we ended up doing, and uh, uh, I worked with the students to think about the problem and um, uh, think about how to solve this in a privacy-friendly way, uh, and finally resolved by doing this, that we only stored the hashed ID of users um, that they found and their location and no other results. And in this way, you can find you can find the matches and you can find you can verify results without uh, uh, impeding on the privacy of the users. Um, so this was a very good example of doing the privacy by design and the ethics by design in a in a, a security research. 
Um, and that is actually what I wanted to say and what I wanted to tell you about with our ethical committee. Thank you very, very much for this interesting talk. Do we have some questions? So please line up at the microphones now. We have some time for Q&A. Microphone two, please. Did your institution, I guess in this case school, did they see any value in what you were doing or did they only perceive you to be a threat? Um, it, it took a while. So we started this with last year. And it took a while for them to see the value of this approach. <coughs> but now that I'm very, um, uh, that I was enthusiastic and that we get actually very good results, they see some value in this. Um, but it took a very long time, yes. Thank you. Microphone three, please. Uh, do you have any tips for um, organizations that are refreshing their security curriculum to take into account? Um, uh, I would take, I would take uh, if you're refreshing your curriculum and you're doing projects, then I, I would very much recommend taking this procedure into account. That you start with the students um, uh, with ethics in their project immediately. There is some question from the IRC. Yeah, I have actually two. So to catch. Uh, both? Yeah, okay. So, um, the process of ethics is neutral. To what extent does the ethical committee inflict the norms or values on the students? And the second question is, to what, what extent can students act even if their norms and values are not in line with the committee? Okay. Um, um, we try not to impose <coughs> Sorry. Uh, we try not to impose too much of our values onto the students. Um, but we are, I mean, the university is a very public organization uh, and has its reputation to think about also. Um, so we have to be careful with that. But we do, um, we do, do a very open, uh, we have a very open debate about the, the norms um, uh, and the, the, the evaluations that the students do, and this is in the discussion. Um, so we try not to impose this. And um, the second question was... Um, uh, to what extent can students act even if the norms and values are not in line with the committee? Um, In the end, the, the ethical committee decides, and, and the teacher decides what uh, what we can do. Um, and if this doesn't align, and, and that we don't agree that this is an important subject to do, then the student is not allowed to do it during the curriculum. He's free to do it in his own time, but it won't be a, a great work. At microphone two, please. Um, are you considering uh, an ethical code of conduct? A student could uh, take an oath when they uh, graduate from the university. Similar thing is, is happening in the University of Groningen, at the mm -hmm. physics department, that a student can take an oath they don't work in the arms race industry and uh, work on, the, well, you know what. Um, something similar, I think uh, EFF has some, some code of ethics. Yeah, the, the EFF, they... Um I forgot the name. There's an, an, a code of ethics for system administrators, um, and we we try to uh, we educate them about that one, um, but we don't we don't enforce this on the onto the students after the curriculum. No. No, I'm not saying I'm forcing. No, no, no. This no is in, in Groningen, this is just an optional thing you can do when you uh, take your ball and go go. Okay. No, well, we haven't really thought about it. It's something that we present and, and that we present as a good thing because it, it also helps you a little bit with... Uh, if you're forced to make hard choices, then you can point to this public document and say, 
This is an oath that I abide by. Um, uh, and this is not something that I thought up, but this is something that, that exists and that other people have thought about. Yeah. Um, so that's what we do, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mike, Mike. Number three. Number three. Hi, first let me say uh, that it's really great that you're doing this. Um, I was at the University of Amsterdam uh, also ages ago and we had some extracurricular classes on ethics on the Faculty of Computer Sciences. Um, but what I'm uh, questioning is, um, why don't you uh, expand the whole ethics uh, question uh, also into the design phase? Is This is just security research, but there's also ethics questions in picking libraries or uh, making design decisions on, on networking equipment or software design. Um, I think it would be great if it could be expanded. A lot of flaws that we've seen presented here on, on the CCC come yeah. from poor design decisions or because people think, well, I can get away with it. And that's, um, um, it's something that we've been subconsciously working already with. Um, uh, but it's not something that we explicitly uh, have been doing, but it may be something for the future. Then the... Ah, it's working again. <laughs> so there are some more questions from the internet. Yeah. What? One? Um, did the lawyer even intervene or do anything? Like, did he understand the problem he was presented with? Um, the, the lawyer in the um, ethical committee for the faculty <coughs> is actually very constructive. And um, uh, she helps with the, um, uh, dis discussing the law and what the boundaries of the law are. Um, I'm not completely sure whether she actually stopped anything yet, but it, it, it is sometimes helpful to understand what the, what the actual boundaries are and what you have to think about. Add microphone two, please. Um, you talk about the, the traffic light with the red, green, yellow. Um, the parameters you have to classify which one is red and yellow and green, do you have that public somewhere? Can I have a look at that? Because that yeah. sounds interesting. And so this is still <coughs> very much um, a work in progress, but our whole procedure is online at the, the website. If you click through there, you info and then ethics, um, and you see the the, um, the evaluation procedure and some of the examples that we have for each of the uh, different um, uh, classes. Yeah. So as I can see, no more questions. Thanks a lot again, Jeroen. Give him another applause. <laughs>